Hello from Germany and welcome to my channel World War II Diaries. Bad news reached me a few days ago. YouTube cancelled the monetization for this channel. That's good for you, no commercial breaks. Bad for me, no money at all. So I don't, I don't want to beg for money, but if you donate a dollar or a euro every month, we can keep up the work and we can finish Rudolph's diaries up to eight, uh, 85 episodes. And we, the next we want to do is um, World War II diary from a tanker who was in Normandy and fought until 1945. So if you want to see that, support us, please support us. And if half of you donate an euro or a dollar, we can keep up the work. You will see a donation link in the description. And thank you for the support. So now we start with a new episode. At the moment, the defense of our flank is what's keeping us alive here. Or keeping us from being cut off. Ivan seems to be everywhere, and if you manage to secure one area of incursion, there's always immediately another sector that needs to be defended. For days now, we've been in combat. Heidi has taken in a lot, but also saved us from worse. Ammunition resupply was sparse but we are all at the end of our strengths. The platoon leader comes to that realization and finally relieves us into the rear area. We've kept up well and always achieved our goal, but tank kills were not racked up, despite all the fighting. While the gun is hitting, it's like dealing with the devil, and there are always a few millimeters missing for a direct hit. We scored a few anti-tank guns and trucks, but only rendered one BT-7 immobilized and hit two T-34s without being able to destroy them. Well, alright. But now back to the repair shop and to our quarters. We moved farther into the hinterland and took over new accommodations. Apparently here the front has stabilized, and we hope it will remain this way. I'm that tired. The last few days were really strenuous. Over and over shelling by mortars, Stalin organs or artillery. Then again, airplanes, over to the next breakthrough, the infantry is calling for help. Quickly over there, it wasn't so easy, but we did our best. Our commander is lightly wounded. He received a few pieces of shrapnel in his shoulder. Not really bad, but painful. I'm still chatting with the men from the repair unit. And here, too, one can see that they hardly get any rest. Damaged tanks are constantly coming in. Or they have to go forward and tow broken down vehicles. This is also costing lives. Good men have also been hit badly during such recoveries especially when the tanks haven't been completely secured, can a Russian troop quickly make a breakthrough and catch the men out cold. I'm taking care of our quarters and try to make it as cozy as possible. It's time for a few lines home and possibly I'll also be able to make a few drawings. After a quiet night and with new strength, it's going into the next day. Already, a new mission comes in. Together with two men, we are to give support. We are supposed to ride along with the reconnaissance and take a look at an area where the unit is planning a large-scale relief attack. While our planes were able to yield some information, the features of the terrain and the possibilities for cover aren't recognizable from the air. So, we are along with it. In a field car and with two scout cars, it's going across the Russian landscape. It's still dusty and warm, but that could change soon. We pass the security lines. 
There, the enemy movements are briefly talked about, but everything here appears to be quiet. Then, it's going into no man's land, at the brisk pace. At the three kilometers, we stop and take a look at the terrain. Many depressions, several small ditches, which are passable, a ridge ahead, which also could be dotted with anti-tank guns. But there's no swamp or mud here. Everything is all right so far. Our driver takes a few notes and the armored reconnaissance vehicle continues driving in the direction of the ridge, about three kilometers away, to scout there as well. We look after it as it disappears among the vegetation and wait. We are alert, since this is all Russian-held territory. For my taste, the scouts have advanced too far. But all right, that's not within my responsibility. The master sergeant will know what he's doing. Then, as if I'd anticipated it, comes across the radio. Enemy contact ahead. Vehicle has been hit and immobilized. We jump up and get on our way. We hear the firefight. No heavy weapons, however, in the battle noise. That's strange. But now we're trying to cover the distance quickly in order to help the comrades. We do have to restrain ourselves a bit, since the field car has nothing but sheet metal. Anything will go through it. In the dust cloud of the eight-wheeled scout car, we try to keep up. Having arrived on the top of the ridge, we also immediately see our comrades. The vehicle is lying on its side, one tire has been shot through, and the car apparently crashed. That way they weren't able to employ their main armament. We get up to the comrades and keep ourselves a bit further back behind the vehicle. We jump out and rush over. There are two wounded and the master sergeant is still busy forcing the Russian troop into cover. They are probably also just a reconnaissance unit without heavy weapons. Now the 20mm from our second scout car is joining in. The attackers quickly realize that they won't get any further here. But if we linger here too long, the Russian will surely send reinforcements and give us hell here. We took care of the wounded, there's one broken leg and a gunshot wound to the upper torso, but nothing deadly. We load the wounded into the field car. The master sergeant of the crashed vehicle is giving instructions to set the damaged car back on its wheels. As fast as the wind, steel cables are attached and with a jolt the car comes back on its wheels. The engine is started. It's still running. The spare wheel is brought up and before you know it, the vehicle is jacked up and the wheel is getting changed. Boy oh boy, they are quick. And already the car is back on its wheels. I'm put behind the 20mm since the comrade from the scout car has been injured. Already it's going onward again. Not a moment too soon, since we can hear the growl of engines. The Russians are sending planes and want to mess us up now. They're coming in low, but right away we sent a few greetings in that direction. While we are not hitting anything, they know that we are capable of defending ourselves as well. We get on our way and are hoping that those mosquitoes will leave us alone now. Again, those guys come flying in. I try to shoot blocking fire and that way I prevent them from coming at us from behind. The planes finally turn away and we get away without a further scratch. Later, we are again able to slip through our friendly lines and even take up some speed. I'm covered in dust and have the feeling that my mouth is as dry as the desert. Back at quarters, we hand over the wounded and discuss the mission with the first lieutenant of the reconnaissance unit. The findings are important for us tankers and we pass it on to support the planning. We are later taken over to the reconnaissance unit and get to share some of the stray pick. Later, this day has also gone by. I make my way to the quarters. But I do want to report back to the commander quickly, who still appears to be up. He's not in his quarters, however, and I find out that the pieces of shrapnel that he caught are somewhat worse than they first appeared. 
So, once again, over to the field hospital to see how it's going. First, the medics don't even want to allow me to see him, but I insist. I get to him, he's drenched in sweat and does not look good at all. Nevertheless, he greets me, and right away, I have to tell him how it was. He listens, does not ask any questions, and just nods slightly. He and there, a smile. Then also comes a good man, and I shouldn't always risk my skin so easily. I ask how he's doing. He states it was just some kind of infection, or something similar. But one can see that he'll probably be tied to the bed for the next few days, and won't be able to be deployed. Well, that's a nice mess. I think in two days it will get going again, and then we'll probably get a replacement commander. I assured him to take care of everything so far and to keep him posted on how it's going. The next day I get the crew together and explain what's going on. The comrades aren't thrilled. I notice the men are in no mood for some kind of newbie who out of ambition might steer the tank into doom. Tomorrow there's a situational meeting and one of the long barreled commanders informs me I should join in. Well, look here. I haven't had a situational meeting in a long time. Certainly they want to hear my opinion again about the scouting mission. Therefore, I study the maps which we still possess and wait for what happens. The situational conference is early at 7 a.m. The rest of the platoon leaders and commanders from my company are assembled and are waiting for the company commander. He enters the room and everything becomes quiet. He doesn't say anything. The silence is unbearable. Then just comes a the bag is soon shut, gentlemen. We listen intently to the boss's elaborations regarding the focal point of our next attack. I keep further to the back and remain invisible. I also don't want to draw attention. Then suddenly I hear my name and I'm supposed to come to the map table. Dead silence. The boss again wants to know from me about the terrain coming from the mouth of the tank man. I explain the circumstances as well as possible. And my explanation seems to be helpful for the planning. Sectors of attack are assigned, timetables discussed, and here it's now supposed to go forward once again. In a way, we are driving a wedge into an armored pincer of the Russians. Then encircle and annihilate if our forces are sufficient, just like it had worked all the time in 1942. Well then, the conference is over, but my platoon leader holds me back and states I should still wait. The room empties out, and the captain approaches me. He never really says much, but his piercing eyes seem to look worn down into the soul. Then I'm told, short and brief, that I was to take over the tank as commander for the assault. He didn't have any experienced men anymore and he couldn't put the wounded into the turret. Just don't do anything stupid and always remember to keep your mouth shut. With that, he tosses me out of the meeting room and I march off to inform my crew. We still receive a gunner, Lance Corporal Pfeiffer, also a good man. I grab him right away and we talk things over. He also knows how things work, and I think for the mission it will work out already. As usual, we get ourselves ready, but a bit nervous, I sit down in the commander's seat. I check the vision blocks and try to remember all the things I have to think about. Now. It really depends on me, and the men are respecting the right decisions in any situation. So far, we are well prepared, and I believe we'll make it all right. Once again, we go over everything, and then I agree to meet with the men by the tank 
at 4 a.m. the next morning. The night is restless. I wake up early already. A bit early, I get on my way, and I'm already at the tank in the semi-darkness. Busy commotion everywhere. My men are there. We still talk about this and that. A few jokes are cracked. That relieves the tension and helps to prepare for what's to come. A few other commanders also stop by and wish me luck. That helps. They trust me and know whom they have covering their back. The engines are started. 20 minutes later, I give the order to drive off.